All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for yet another student of the gun radio. Aren't you lucky? Don't you feel fortunate? And if you don't feel fortunate, well, you should, because you are living in a time. You are living in the same time as student of the gun radio. Imagine that. Imagine that. What are we going to talk about today? Thank you very much for asking. No cash, no liberty, no guns. Yes, indeed. We need to get our we need to get our priorities straight as a culture and uh, understand the actual real threats that we're dealing with. We've got a Duracoat Finish Firearms section for you. We're going to talk about Grandpa's gun. How many of you have Grandpa's gun or your dad's gun or your great uncle Jim's gun? Well, we're going to talk about that today. Uh, you know what month it is? Zach, did you know this? Did you realize that, that it was National Stop the Bleed Month? I did not. And now that you say that out loud, I now realize that I should change what the promotion for this week should be. Yeah, so May is National Stop the Bleed Month, and I was reminded of that by our friends at Brownells. So we'll get into that a little bit later. And then, of course, we have a uh, Student of the Gun Homeroom brought to you by Crossbreed Holsters. Talk about being dangerous on demand. And should we or should we not be firing warning shots at people? Yes, and I know most of you in the audience, you, you already have the answer. I know that you have the answer, but apparently there are some people that do not have the answer. So we're going to have to help them out. And then we're going to talk about money. Money, 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 money. Money. Talk about money at the very end. No cash, no liberty, no guns. All of that and more on today's super cool, fantastical episode of Student of the Gun Radio. Welcome to Student of the Gun Radio, planting freedom seeds since 2013. Here we don't just talk about guns and gear, we also discuss current events and politics. Because guns are politics. Now, sit back, relax, and allow today's episode to drip ever so gently into your ear. Please welcome your co-hosts, founder of Mastermind Media and Consulting Group, Jared Martin, and the shipping ogre, Zach Martin. Now, give it up for your beloved host, the Pin Pan of America, Professor Paul Markle. Yes, indeed, it is I. And I'm wearing my, my honey badger hat today. Ruthie loves the badger hat. She does. She likes my badger hat. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's because you're not watching live in Discord. But if you were watching live in the Discord, you would be seeing my badger hat. And I'm wearing my my fantastic Dixon flannel from Brownells. This is the Brownells branded Dixon flannel. So this is my very own it's not it's not blue it's not red it's a neutral color so i can go back and forth and you know i can either go into the crip area or the blood area and i'm good to go because i'm a neutral color <laughs> all right we got a review of the week this week and uh, jared do you want to do the review of the week you feel like you can do that i think i can make it through one sentence okay or one paragraph all zach and jared speak the truth whether you want to hear it or not our country is in deep crap if you want to be able to distinguish between the crap and the good, give SOTG a listen. I don't believe that you will regret it. That's from Rob Smith on iTunes. Thank you very much, Rob Smith on iTunes, for leaving a review. And congratulations to you for being the review of the week. Now, you can go run around the house screaming right now. They read my review. They read my review. All right. And you could be. The review of the week, if you would go to iTunes or Spotify or iHeartRadio or whatever your favorite podcatcher is and leave a review, freak. It makes a difference and you could be famous. All right. It is time for a Duracoat Finish Firearm segment of the week brought to you by our good friends at DuracoatFirearmFinishes.com. All right, let's talk about Dura Blue. If you are not aware, uh, you should be aware that Dura Coat has a lot of different options. Many, 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 many options. They've got the basic colors, they've got the camouflage colors, then they have the fancy stuff like the Dura Dyes, which looks like anodizing. 
And then they have the uh, Parker Rising. Uh, and they also have Bluing. This is something, this was one of Steve's pet projects a few years ago. Because uh, if you've ever, if you don't know about bluing, right, gun bluing, uh, it can be a very detailed and meticulous process, and it can seem kind of expensive. I, I know uh, several years ago when I looked at getting a gun re-blued, uh, first of all, not everybody can do it because a traditional bluing process takes a lot uh, well, before Duracoat, it took a lot uh, to do. And so what I did is as I looked around and I found out it was going to be like 200 to $250 to have the barrel of an old shotgun re -blued. And I'm going to admit something to you guys. I thought about it and I was like, do I want to spend 200 to $250 to have this barrel re -blued? And then wait six weeks. And my answer to myself was not really. <laughs> but thanks to Duracoat and uh, the late great Steve Lauer, they came up with a Dura Blue. And uh, the Dura Blue comes in different colors. Gun bluing, you can get it in a traditional bluish blue or a blue black color or a matte black color, or you can get the polished one. So it's super shiny. Uh, so you can either get it so it's not shiny or super shiny or whatever. Uh, the reason I bring it up is because actually uh, somebody, a friend of mine, was showing me uh, recently a hand-me-down gun. It was a hand-me-down pistol uh, from his grandfather. And as typical of our grandfathers, our grandfathers were wonderful human beings, and they also did stuff like take pistols and put them in the zip up gun rugs and zip them up and put them on the closet shelf and just leave them there for months at a time, years at a time. Uh, let's face it. As grandpas get older and older, they spend less and less time at the shooting range. Maybe when they were younger, they used to shoot it a lot. And now they're 69, 68, 67 years old or 72 or 75 or whatever. So grandpa is like, you know, I got that pistol in the closet. It's on the shelf and it's in the it's in that case. I'm like, oh, can I take a look at that, grandpa? Sure, go go get it. And you unzip it, and there's orange all over it. And he's like, I wasn't like that when I put it up there. Grandpa, when did you put it up there? Oh, I don't know. A few years ago. So there you are. Which translates into a decade. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Seriously, that's that's totally serious. So, any user, so there you are. You got Grandpa's gun, and it's got orange on it. So, what do you do as the conscientious dude? Uh, you get out. You know, you get out the the brushes and uh, the oil and and the so forth, and you you get it wire brushes or copper brushes, and you get all the orange off. But here's the deal. Grandpa's gun was an original blued steel gun. And now that you've removed the corrosion and the rust, what have you got? Well, there's no bluing there anymore. Now it's just down to the bare metal. And here is what I'm going to tell you. If you just leave it bare metal, it's going to rust again. Or you're going to have to continually oil that thing over. I mean, I mean, you should oil your guns anyway, but you're going to have to continuously oil it. And besides that, now the finish looks funky, right? You've got these spots on the finish where some of it's blue, and then you have shiny silver gray where there's no bluing left. And you might be that guy who's thinking, man, I'd, I'd really like to re-blue Grandpa's old gun. But I went and I talked to a dude, and he's like, oh, well, to do the whole thing, it'll be $269 in tax, and I, I can get to it in six to eight weeks. That's when you go, uh. well, here's the good news. The good news is if you've got grandpa's old gun or your dad's old gun or your uncle Jim's old gun or whatever, you can re-blue it yourself. Yeah, you can re-blue it yourself. Uh, and you, you just have to be able to follow directions. Now, if you cannot follow directions, I I can't help you. <laughs> I mean, 
Yeah, that's if you can't follow the directions, you're like, that's great, Paul. That's all well and good. But I have a complete and total inability to follow directions. Well, if you have a complete and total inability to follow directions, then go pay somebody to do it. But if you can, you can reblue grandpa's old gun, uh, whether it's a pistol or a rifle or shotgun or whatever, and make it look new again. And uh, so if here's the thing. If it if the gun was passed down to you as an inheritance, then you can make grandpa's gun look really neat and you can cherish it. And you say, OK, I have something that belonged to my grandfather. Or if you're a super righteous young man, younger man or woman. And you're hoping that grandpa's going to that they're going to leave that gun to you. <laughs> what you do is you say, grandpa, your gun's all screwed up. But here's what we can do. We can make it look new again. And you take it, you make it look new again. You give it back to grandpa or great uncle Jim or whatever, or maybe your dad. And they look at it and they're like, wow, this looks like the day I bought it. Thank you. And then they're going to go put it away. <laughs> but, uh, or they might say to you, you know what? Just go ahead and hang on to it for me. And if I ever want it back, I'll come get you. I've had, I've had that a few times. I've had the, just go ahead and hang on to that. And if I want it back, I'll come, I'll let you know. That's and the I'm best like, kind. Wink, wink, nod. I get it. I get it. So yes, that is the Duracoat finish firearm of the day segment to all that good stuff. And, and of course we talked last week about the uh, sexy high point contest. And uh, within one week, this is me looking at you, telling you, Within one week, we will have the specific details about the submissions for the Sexy High Point Contest. There you go. All right. Uh, speaking of Sexy High Points, uh, if you – did we talk about the 30 Super last week, Zach? Uh, You're welcome. We Thanks for asking. Yeah. Super. Thanks for asking. Uh, I believe we did mention it, but I don't think we went into, like, detail. Why do you ask? Oh, Okay. Uh well yeah last week we talked we 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 had Dave if you guys didn't listen to the NRA interviews if you're like ah oh, well you know I didn't have time or I got busy or whatever go back and listen through the last couple of weeks the previous weeks uh to the NRA interviews that's a lot of good stuff we jammed a tremendous amount of material into just a couple of episodes and uh, one of those in one of those episodes we talked with Dave Dave was there. We had a lot of Daves. We got a lot of Daves that are either here or not here, depending on what day it is. Uh, but Dave was there, and he talked about uh, how high point. We I love it when Dave comes because he's such a good sport. Would you say that's true? Jer's not in his head. Zach, would you Absolutely. say that's true? I would say that he's a great sport. Dave Dave is a good sport because we we give him the business when he comes on. <laughs> You know, we give him the business about the future and we were giving him the business about uh, how High Point design, designed a gun around a magazine. <laughs> well, they kind of did, you know, I mean, they had the they had the 10 millimeter carbine with a 10 round, you know, stick mag. And then they designed the pistol a couple of years after the rifle or the, the carbine was out. And I said, so basically you just designed a pistol around the magazine. Right. And he's like, um, not really, but kind of, okay. If that's what you want to say. And I said, all right, that's what I just said. And, uh, so what do they have now? They have the, uh, the 30 super. Thanks for, thanks for asking. asking. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Uh, I've, I've got a, We've got a, a little bit of a drinking problem here. Maybe it's a cup problem. Every time I sat my cup down and I spilled coffee on the desk, but I'm fixing that right now. But anyway, the 30 Super, thanks for asking. They did a carbine. And I said, so what you did is you designed the magazine for the carbine, and now you're going to design a pistol around that magazine next, right? And, and poor Dave, he's like, I cannot confirm or deny. <laughs> oh, but so there you go. There you go. You if, see, if you're if you're really interested in the 30 super cartridge, um, but you don't want to spend three thousand nine hundred dollars on a on a Nighthawk, 
list. <laughs> and also, you realize that the 30 Super ammunition costs more than 9 millimeter ag- ammunition. So, I, can, can, I, can we be honest with each other for a second? Am I allowed to be honest with each other with us? Uh, go for it. All right, Zach says I am super ammo. So why in the name of all that is holy would you design a new handgun round that is smaller than a nine millimeter and price it so that it's like twenty five to thirty percent more than nine millimeter ammunition? I mean, they, you know that they had to know going into this that it was going to be more expensive. Hornady has FTX defensive critical defense ammo for a dollar twenty a shot. Practice ammo, Blazer practice ammo, fifty cents a shot. Ladies and gentlemen, I mean, I I love my friends over at Federal, but dudes, dudes. Dudes, seriously. Like, do you and the you here's here's who I see really getting excited about the 30 super influencers and um professional gun people who get their ammo for free as a promotional consideration. <laughs> I don't know anyone who actually has to dig into their own pocket and buy ammo who's excited about the 30 Super. But I digress. You're like, well, you just knocked yourself right off the getting free 30 Super ammo thing, Paul. (laughs) Here's what the 30 Super is. It is it is a grotesque waste and abuse of small pistol primers. That's what it is. The, all the small pistol primers that are being stuck into thirty super ammo could have been stuck into nine millimeter ammo. All right. If and if that's too mean for you, then I don't know what to say. Jared, do you want to talk about Juxy? dot com? Um. I would love to talk about Juxy, but I don't know how long my voice is okay, going to make. He's it. not going to talk about it, but I'll right, talk I about can, it. Oh, you can go ahead and talk about that. All right. So here's what Zach did. Well, what did you? What is the latest video on Juxi dot com? Well, the latest video on Juxi dot com, Juxi dot com, on the official Student of the Gun page is the Hoth Report full compilation. So yes. As, yeah, as you know, last week was uh, May the Fourth Be with you, and then Revenge of the Fifth. And so, to because Star Wars stuff, we decided to go ahead and slap some, uh, take our official Star Wars series and slap it all together into one nice little easy to watch compilation, and put it up right there. So it, it's not super long. The Hoth Report was was a pretty easy, quick watch. So uh, the whole series yes. combined is what about seventeen minutes? Yes, it's less than twenty. Yeah, so it won't take you that long to go through there and. Just give that a little watch and uh, airplay, it, time. airplay it to your TV. And also, I was today years old when I learned about Revenge of the Fifth. Really? You didn't oh, know really? That? Yeah. No, I didn't know. Yeah. That yes. was the thing. Absolutely. They, they've kind of gone bananas with that whole thing. Thankfully, there's no pun for saying A N A N A N A N A N bananas. B A N A N A N A N. Head over to jukesy.com, go to the Student Gun channel, or just click the link in the description. And uh, you will be taken over to that video. So yes, that. you should. If you haven't watched it, watch it. We, Zach and I went out in the frozen tundra. We went out in the cold. We hiked way up into the mountains, into the deep, deep snow to film that. So it would be kind of it would be kind of cra- crazy if you didn't support that. All right. If you're a new listener, and even if you're not, but if, especially if you're a relatively new listener, you need to perk up your ears and listen louder. Please. Attention, new listeners. We produced a complimentary online training course called Seven Training Tips That Could Save Your Life. Get instant access by joining the Student Lounge for free at studentofthegun.com. Do you watch Student of the Gun TV, read the blog, and follow us on Facebook? If you answered no to any of these questions, you are wrong, but you can easily fix yourself. Go to studentofthegun.com to find everything SOTG.
Yes, indeed. That's what you should do. Go to studentofthegun.com for everything SOTG and start listening louder and watching louder and reading louder and all that good stuff. What do we do every week? Well, we do a little thing called Brownells Bullet Points, and this is where we talk about some hardware and some gear and some stuff that we can put our hands on, and today is no exception, so listen up. Yes, indeed. We were. Bu- I was pretty busy this weekend. I had an exceedingly busy weekend. Did a bunch of traveling, and I wasn't. I'm going to admit to you that I was not checking Brownell's website every day. I'm have, I'll have to admit that to you. But I did check it yesterday, and I saw that they had a uh, a special thing on their homepage. It said May is Stop the Bleed Month. It's National Stop the Bleed Month, which is I don't know. Jared and Zachary. Zach, are you that you're there with us, right? I am indeed still here. What's up? Uh, I don't know. Should I take credit for this? Or should I not? Because I think so, yeah. There I can count on one hand the number of people that were professional firearms instructors that were in our industry fifteen years ago that were telling people get the training, carry the gear save people's lives is that fair to say that i could count those people on one hand i think that's completely fair so and uh james was one of them james was obviously one of them james jaeger was one of the people who he was one of the first in the industry one of the first firearms trainers in the industry to start to tell people, to tell gun people, look, yeah, it's cool that you've got guns. It's awesome. It's cool that you took fighting training, fighting pistol, fighting rifle, you know, whatever. That is great. That's fantastic. But that's only a small part of the equation or a portion or a percentage of the equation. You've got to, if you're carrying a gun, you've got to learn how to save people's lives. And our industry the pushback now today see in hindsight and i apologize for that in hindsight it's easy for us to say well yeah i mean everybody has tourniquets and all the cops are carrying them now and you know it's it's just commonplace did that did not happen by accident that did not happen just by mere happenstance or, well, it was just going to happen anyway. It was just, it was just a matter of time. It wasn't, no, it wasn't a matter of time. There were people in the gun community. I won't say culture, but in the firearms community, and there still are, although there are fewer of them that were 100% against that. The, the amount of hate mail, that we received and hateful comments and just just vitriol not from the other side not from anti-gun people not from the normies or whatever but from inside of our own community was uh was disheartening and thank the lord i had james uh to lean on and he had me to lean on and we pretty much engaged in peer counseling for the longest time and your uncle dave too Your Uncle Dave's been right there. Uh, As a matter of fact, your Uncle Dave was the first person to tell me, he said, hey, I can't remember. Oh, I need to ask Dave who gave it to him. Someone gave, handed Dave a rat's tourniquet like 10 years ago, literally like the year that Jeff introduced him. And we we were driving. We were on our way to the NRA annual meeting in St. Louis, Missouri. We were in the, so we, had, we were in the truck, in Dave's truck, and we had a lot of time to talk. And he said, hey, I, I, I know that you're, because at the time I was teaching TCCC, and at the time there was, the uh, the rats was not involved in it or at all, but um, so the big things were the cat, or not the cat, the cat, the so, yeah, the cat, the soft tea, uh, and the TK4. Those are the, the primary ones that are being issued to the military at the time. Uh, and your uncle Dave told me, he said, Hey, he said, Hey, this, there's this new tourniquet. 
He goes, I can't. and he said, I don't have one on me. <laughs> he said, but it's it's like a bungee strap, but it's not. And you you got to check it out. And so your uncle Dave told me about that, and then we played a little game called "It's a Small World After All." And uh, I w- I came home from the NRA, and within a month or two, my good friend Shane said, hey, I was on a team with another SF dude, and he invented this super cool tourniquet, and it's called the Rats, and I've got some, and I'm going to send you one. So Shane sent me one, and I got it, and I, I called Dave, and I said, Dave, remember that tourniquet you were telling me about? And he's like, yeah. I said, I've got one in my hands. He's like, what do you think? I was like, once I figured out how to use it, uh, I'll, I'll admit to you, when I first got it, it didn't have any instructions. It was just in a yeah, a sandwich baggie and I was looking at it and I'm like mm. and I called Shane and he's like he goes he goes you gotta have a three finger loop and you gotta have a three finger loop and I'm like no yeah. we figured it out and once I figured it out like oh yeah this is it and we and we in we started including it in the beyond the band-aid classes because I was actually teaching beyond the band-aid classes before I was introduced to the rats. I started in that in like 2010, 2011. Before it became beyond the boo-boo for copyright purposes. Yeah, before it became beyond the boo-boo because Johnson & Johnson doesn't want to let, play nice with us unless she's in the public. But anyway, uh, so this has been a long time coming. And now that it's actually socially acceptable, it's amazing. And it only took 15 years for people to extricate their craniums from their rectum and say, oh, wow, yeah, we should probably, everyone should probably learn how to save lives. What? It's crazy. So what does that have to do with Brownells bullet points? So I'll tell you what, uh, Brownells, you think, well, they said pieces and parts and screws and springs and ammo and all of that stuff. But they also have a little section that we've been telling you about called emergency and survival gear. They've had that for years and years and years. And so if you click on the linky link on brownells.com, they've got one of the main things they have is the pouches. They have blue force gear, medical pouches, North American rescue, medical pouches, echo systems, medical pouches, and so on and so forth. So uh, thank you very much to our friends at Brownells for reminding me that may is national stop the bleed uh month and now that we know that you know there's this little company called student of the gun they have a little website called shop sotg.com and i think i'm just going to shut up and let zach tell you all about it how about that sotg.com is the perfect place to go if you are a student of the gun whether you want to expand your brain increase your marksmanship or help keep your family safe. All that, plus the Pimp Hand brands that you love. ShopSOTG.com has almost anything that an American patriot would want. Education, enlightenment, and entertainment, and we're open 24-7. Check out ShopSOTG.com today and see for yourself. Yes, indeed you do, and over at ShopSOTG.com, in observance of uh, Stop the Bleed Month, right now you can... Okay, right now you can go to shopsotg.com and get a rats or a pocket lifesaver for a snazzy little discount to help us celebrate Stop the Bleed Month. You get the, uh, that is the Limit Kit, which is the Laceration Minor Injury Treatment Kit. We like to think of that one as a, in addition to kind of a thing where like say you've got you know you've got your regular kit in your pocket, but then maybe in your backpack or in the in the in your car or something you got the limit kit. Or say like say you know you've got both on you, but somebody just cuts their hand. Well, you don't want to rip open the big fancy kit with a tourniquet in it and everything. So just pull out the limit kit, boom, wrap that up. You know if they if it's that bad, give them to the hospital and boom, make boom, you're good to go. And of course the original, which is the OG. The Enhanced, which is a little bigger, and the Combat, which that's the big Mamba Jamba, who eh, may or may not fit in your pocket. Depends on how big your pocket is. But 
So yeah, it's got all the good stuff. Combat kit we we recommend to put in your car or in your backpack. You can if you have a giant pocket, you can put it in your pocket. We won't stop you. Uh, and of course, if you just want to get a tourniquet, rapid uh, rapid tourniquets are will also be on sale in addition. So shop s o t g dot com. Go ahead and do that. There you go. You should do that. You can do that. We recommend that you do that. And quite frankly, here we are. Uh, and I've said this before. I said it in the book, the Beyond the Boo Boo book. 15 years ago, if you just said to me, if I said, hey, do you have any medical training? Do you have any medical gear? Do you have traumatic medical gear? And you said to me 15 years ago, no, because I can't find any and I don't know who to go to to get the training. 15 years ago, maybe even 10, I would say, okay, I'll give you that as an excuse. Here's the deal. Right now, as I'm speaking the words into this microphone, the only reason you don't have traumatic medical training and the only reason you don't have traumatic medical gear is because you've made the conscious decision to not buy it and not avail yourself to that training because the training is available and the gear is available. It's not like it was 15 years ago. And you're like, well, I don't have the time. I don't have the inclination. I don't have the money. Mm. Yes, you do. You have all of those. What you don't have is the prioritization. You haven't made it a priority. Now, you not making something a priority doesn't mean it's not important, and it doesn't mean that you have an excuse. It just means that you decided, well, it's not important to me. Um, and I've decided that uh, the the basic cost of the Beyond the, the Boo Boo training class is going to double if you come to me and say, I had a life-threatening situation and I really could have used this, I'm like, cool, I'm going to give you the training and I'm going to charge you double for it. That's when you say, do you hear that, Zach? Uh, you're going to charge double for it? People people were, were calling me, uh, the people out there were calling me a dick. Do um, uh, you know why? Censoring that? God, because why? I've been literally coming to this microphone for 10 years telling you, Get the training to save a life. And you have been saying, I will someday, but not today. I will someday, but not this year. I will someday. And then what happens? You're faced with a situation where you need the skill and you need the gear and you don't have it. That That is the human condition. The closing the barn door after the, the horse is out, right? You need, if you're going to listen to me, you need to be better than that. You need to be better than the average normie, okay? If you are a student of the gun and you're listening to this show, you need to look at yourself in the mirror and say, I'm going to be better than average. I'm going to be above the average. And that is what I want for you. That is my wish and desire for you. All right, let us move on to our student of the gun homeroom brought to you by CrossbreedHolsters.com. Bing, bang, boom. Thank you to Madison Rising for the title music, Dangerous. Are you dangerous on demand? Yes, no, maybe. All right. Zach, will you do me a favor? Open up that uh, linkage. Open up the linkage. The uh, the story, and of course, before you get into that, go to crossreadholsters.com, and when you order a fantastical holster, I want you to use the promo code SOTG, and uh, let them know that Student of the Gun sent you. That's right. Let them know that we sent you to them. It makes a difference because they might be sitting out there thinking, do any of these student of the gun people still listen or pay attention or any of them actually coming to our store? Uh, you know that you are, but you got to let them know. All right. All right. So the uh, story today, you got it open, Zach? Yes, indeed. I do have it open right now. All right. I'm going to have Zach read this one because Jared's voice is not doing well today. Uh, the title of it, and this is a brand new story or relatively new. It's a couple of days old uh, from May 4th, 2023. Uh, Ammoland.com is the source. Knife wielding burglar run off by homeowners warning shots. Yes. 
Yes, indeed. And this yeah. Is, Mul- is that multiple homeowners? We'll find out as we dig deeper into the story. Zach, give us. can you give us the deets, please? The details? Uh, yes, indeed. And the author of this article is Tread Law. I just want to give that uh, Tread Law. That's that right. Credit. Police in Roseburg, Oregon, have arrested Robert N- Nagger after he allegedly... Is he a Nagger or a Nagger? I don't know. N-A-G-E-R. We report... Oh, Naggers. After yeah, he that allegedly makes sense. attempted to break into a trailer and broke its windows with a large knife on Friday morning. The incident reportedly occurred on the 3400 block of Northwest Broad Street, where witnesses and the victims said Nagger was the former neighbor. According to the RPD report, the victim's father chased Na- Nagger away from warning- by firing warning shots from a pistol. Sheriff's deputies later found Nagger's vehicle in the area. I'm going to call him Nager. When people Nager. Nager. When people are out of the house, Nager refused to exit the house until a taser was deployed through a window. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. Oh. It says they found his vehicle in the area. When police arrived at the scene, ex- exit the house. Now, there's something missing in this story, homeboy. Okay. So it says that Nager um, was chased away by the victim's father who fired warning shots from a pistol. And then the next pair says police found him in, in the house. Well, which house is the house? Am I am I the only one who said er, I thought he was chased away? Which house is this homeboy in? Yeah, that's a good point. Is he in his house? It, it, in my okay, so here's how I interpreted this. Yeah, uh, he was chased away by firing warning shots. They knew who he was. They went to his house, and he refused to come out. Oh, that's weird. But that's anyway, my assumption. Um, so back to yeah. If you go to the source, the main source, which is. KQEN News Radio 1240, local on your side. Yes. Uh, says uh, Nigger. Okay, that that's all well and good and and cool and and nice. So we and we actually don't need the rest of the story because that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is this: um, number one, you should be dangerous on demand, and we've we've pounded that nail into the board about a thousand times. And I hope that people get that. Now, here's the deal. It is not enough to own a gun. Do I think that American citizens should be forced and required to take state mandated training? No, because the state is abysmal when it comes to training. The state is the the government is the worst possible source you could go to. But I also think that if you are a responsible adult American citizen and that you own a firearm for self-defense, that you should want to. It should your be it should be your desire to get professional training. Zach, do we or do we not fire warning shots in quote self-defense? We do not. Why not? Because that's dumb. But besides it being dumb, <laughs> is there a reason? Because where is the bullet that you fired randomly going to go? Exactly. So you should know, and uh, the the victim's father should have known, that what comes up must come down. And you, when you launch a bullet from your gun, it's going to end up in something or someone. And you are responsible. If you launch a bullet and it goes up over the top of your trailer home and it cascades down through a window and strikes someone's grandma who's knitting by the front porch or whatever, um, you're responsible for that. That's negligence. You guys understand that, right? But there's also... There's another side to that coin. Zach, we've there's there's three reasons uh, that you're allowed by law. There are three questions that have to be answered before you can legally press the trigger on a on a homo sapien. And what are those? 
you have to they have to have the what ability ability opportunity and intent and intent yeah ability opportunity and intent and you have to you know check all those blocks now it seems to me like homeboy here um that he had all those blocks checked you've got johnny lunatic whether he's a nagger or a nager we're not sure whether he's a nagger or a nager but you got Major. this nager um smashing a armed with a, a large knife smashing a window to attempt entry into a domicile that is demonstrate that's ability and that's intent that's demonstrated ability opportunity and intent so you whip out your roscoe and you say stop stop now either that person stop stops or they don't stop stop and then you put bullets into them and then they stop stop well ladies and gentlemen if you launch bullets deliberately in a direction other than the threat what you are admitting to is that you did not believe that the threat was such that required deadly force right yes shake your heads up and down this guy all right so he could be charged with i don't know whatever in oregon that you know reckless use of a firearm or negligent discharge of a firearm or whatever and he said oh no i'm shooting warning shots at him i'm not a warning shots here's the deal homeboy the deal is you don't get to discharge a firearm in the direction of a human unless you can answer all those questions ability opportunity intent of deadly harm deadly force shooting warning shots is is a tantamount admission that you did not need to use deadly force because believe it or not sounds are not re regulated under deadly force you're like what no the this the noise of gunfire the sound that's not deadly force it might be scary might make you feel a little bit uneasy but it's the actual application of force or the threat of the application ladies and gentlemen we got to be better than this if we're going to be part of the good guy group if we're going to and here's the thing do you, let's go ahead and let me open the the article real quick and i like the guys from ammo land and i think they like me i don't know if they like me or not uh i think they like me too uh yes there we go all right at the very bottom it says it says, however, it's essential to remember that legal gun ownership also comes with responsibilities. Gun owners must understand how to handle and store their firearms safely. I don't get what that has to do with anything. Uh, and how to use them appropriately. I don't know if this is a from the the cops or if this is a, a statement from the... Oh, yeah. It says, uh, some states consider brandishing a gun to be a crime. That is true. So... You are either justified in using deadly force or you're not. And the deal is if you if you are justified in using deadly force, then you are justified in putting bullets into the threat. If you deliberately, yep, I saw that. Legal gun owners have a right to defend themselves and their property, and the mere presence of weapons can defuse the situation. However, uh launching bullets and saying those were warning shots is it's amateur hour it's it's that's the stuff of this is what happens when people get training from from the, when i say training i'm air quoting when they get their training from watching movies from watching tv you know watching old westerns or some crazy stuff ladies and gentlemen warning shots are negligence and if a prosecutor really wanted to get froggy with you admitting that you fired quote warning shots is an admission to negligent discharge of a firearm and i'm pretty sure that in every state in the union there's a statute that says you're not allowed to negligently discharge a firearm okay 
So we've got to do better than this. We've got to do better. You're like, yeah, but what are you saying? Every time I pull my gun out, I have to shoot him. No, that's not what I said. Dork, go sit down. What I'm saying is that if you point a firearm at a human, you need to understand that either A, you're going to press the trigger because it's required, or B, you're not going to. But the idea that you can just scare them off, I don't give a crap what Joe Biden said. Joe Biden is a dog king. He's a meat puppet. He's a mongoloid. All right. We don't fire warning shots. Matter of fact, all 50 states, go look it up. All 50 states in the union have legal prohibitions against doing that. Now, the the prosecutors in this situation might decide to be nice because this was a, you know, a situation where where Nagger, uh, the Nagger uh, needed to, you know, leave them alone. But folks, you can't do that. You got to understand we don't fire warning shots. And for the love of all that's holy, I'm not even going to get into the quote, shoot to wound retardedness. Uh, but we got to be better. You got to be better than that. And like I said, owning a gun no more makes you an armed citizen than owning a guitar makes you a musician. And this is a great example of that. All right. How far in are we, Zach? We're approaching 47 minutes. 47 minutes. There we go. Then we got time. All right. How many of you have recently, how many of you recently have uh, encountered, and this is happening in our cities, in our metropolitan areas, a facility that says, that says uh, no cash, cards only, Apple Pay only, this only, that only. And you've been okay with it. Mm. Not me. Well, what you want to do, who has money on them right now? Do you have, who has actual cash on them? I actually do have cash. I do. I have a dollar bill because I am rolling in it. This is my dollar bill right here. It's a one dollar bill. I got a Washington here. And uh, to the very left of Washington's head, under the words United States of America, it says this note is legal tender. Some fancy words for you guys there. If you went to public schools, you're like, I don't even know what that means. For all debts, public and private. So when someone says to you, when a business says to you, we're cashless, aren't we a feat? Aren't we modern? Aren't we convenient? No, you're scum. And they'll tell you, for convenience. It's not for convenience. It might be because they hire criminals. It might be because that stadium, you're like, yeah, well, this, yeah, the stadium, the sports ball stadium in my city is cashless. Why is the sports ball stadium in your city cashless? Is it because it makes it so much more convenient for you? Or is it because they hire thieves? Like, well, we cut down on it. What they won't say in public is we greatly reduce the amount of employee thievery by being cashless. Riddle me this, Batman. Is that my problem? No, it is not my problem. You, you know, you, the lack of morals in the city in which you live is not my problem. And it's not my job to fix. It's your job to fix. But there's an even bigger... You know how they fix it if they don't go digital? How? They pass the price down to the consumer. Hmm. So no matter what, you're bearing the cost. Well, yeah, okay. That, that might be true. But here's the thing. On the face, it seems like, oh, well, either A, you say, I don't care, doesn't bother me. And then, Jared, will you get the rape of the mind? The next time you want to say, when you encounter a situation and it, it, you get that little tinge, that little ting in your gut or in your head, that you're like, this situation seems not right. 
this situation seems unusual or like something's wrong with it, but, I, but there's just nothing I can do with about it. And I just have to go along with it. And yeah, there's nothing I can do. If you feel like that, you need to buy this book. It's called The Rape of the Mind, The Psychology of Thought Control, Menticide, and Brainwashing by Yus Mirlu. We have, I don't, I don't know if it's us, but I'm going to go ahead and take credit for it. Um, this book is now a number one bestseller in its category. It wasn't a month ago when I bought it, because or two months ago. Two months ago, I went online and I bought this, this book. It was not the number one bestseller in its category two months ago. And strangely, today, it is. It's called The Rape of the Mind by Eust Merlo. Buy this book and read it. Cashless. Well, what does that mean? Well, if it's cashless, that means that you are going to have to use some form of payment that will record that transaction, that will create a, a record of that transaction, whether it's a Visa MasterCard, whether it's your bank debit card, whether it's you're like, oh, I use Apple Pay. There's no record of my transaction with Apple Pay. Okay, there's no. I use Venmo. There's no record of the transaction with Venmo. Okay, whatever. Yeah, there's no record of transaction with um, Ashley Madison either, is there? You guys remember uh, just a short time ago, this has only been like a year ago, when Visa announced that it's going to track gun store sales? Remember that? And a, a fierce political battle is emerging among Americans who buy guns. A move by Visa and other credit card companies to identify purchases at gun stores and flag them as such has inflamed Republican lawmakers. Now, I want to know why Democrat lawmakers thought this was okay. Why do Democrats think that it's okay for a bank to flag your private purchases, your legal lawful purchases? Because well, gun control is in their platform. Exactly. Anybody who says, well, the De Democrats and Republicans are all the same. This reminds me that we've got a guest on May 22nd coming to talk about insurance um, companies. And uh, we received a report about, I don't know if it, who's lobbying them to do this, but somebody is lobbying insurance companies to um, lobby to restrict your gun rights by pushing for um, the requirement to have and a policy for every individual gun that you have. Oh, an individual policy for every gun. So you have to put every time you buy a gun, you have to add a rider to yeah. your policy. Yeah, it's okay. it's just making it more difficult and more expensive for people yeah. to have and own guns. So you say, oh, hang on, Paul. The Republicans, and this is when everybody who says Republicans and Democrats are all the same, they're all the same. Bah, 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 bah. Well, if that were actually the case then right now Visa would be tracking every single purchase. Uh, well, they actually, you said, well, th this this didn't pass, or they, they recanted. They got enough pressure to recant, right? So they're like, oh, 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 uh, Visa, MasterCard, Discover will pause their work on a special code that would track gun purchases. There was enough pressure that they paused it. Do you guys understand what the tactic of the trial balloon is? Do you understand that? A trial balloon is when you, well, it just goes back to like, I don't know, centuries, but you, you can look it up on the Google. But a trial balloon in the political sense is when they, they put, they have somebody, the Democrats do this all the time. They'll take a congressman who's in what they call a safe district, like New York, right? Or Washington, D.C., where they know they own that. New York City, the Democrats know that they can run a desk lamp for, for a congressional seat, and the desk lamp will win. All right. They know that. 
So what they do is they will take a someone from a safe district where they don't have to worry about if the people get mad, they're going to get unelected because that doesn't happen. And they'll say, go out and say this. Go out and support this. They give them a script. And they go out and they say, I'll give you a great example. During the Clinton administration, he sent his evil, demonic harpy of a wife out. And uh, he put her, okay, I don't need, I should, I shouldn't have to tell you this, but the first lady of the United States, the FLOTUS, is an honorary position. Nowhere in the Constitution does it give the first lady legal authority to do anything. She has zero, none, nada. That is an unelected person. I remember Bill Burr had a whole bit about that, about the the first lady, and he's like, "Yeah, I, I appreciate what you're saying, but um, why should I give a crap? We didn't elect you. We elected your husband. The only political power you have is being married." Oh, he's absolutely right. But it started, I, you know, you know who started? I think it was Dolly Madison who started it. Uh, that they decided, well, the while the wife is there. She needs something to do, right? And so what they generally do is they give her some type of a charitable thing, right? They're like, go out and stump for the Red Cross or go out and like with Nancy Reagan, it was go out and, you know, you, do, you know, say no to drugs and every, the, you know, all the first ladies have these little pet projects, right? They have these little pet projects, which is fine until... They send the first lady out to create policy. There's a big difference between the first lady going out and saying, you know what? Everyone needs to eat better. We need to have better eating habits or everyone needs to support the Red Cross or everybody needs to whatever, you know, stop doing crack. All right. Stop doing crack, kids. All right. Thank you. That's one thing. It's a completely different thing to allow the first lady to have a political or to have a government funded program to be in charge of a government funded program to create policy. And see, that's where we we slipped down that slippery slope back in the 90s. We allowed that evil, demonic harpy Hillary Clinton. Uh, well, basically, she told her husband, her spineless freaking philanderer, the serial rapist, that she was going to do that. Of course, he went out and said it was his idea, but we know it wasn't. So she formed a committee and she was in charge of a committee to come up with universal health care. She was going to come up with a socialist, European style, Canadian style, universal health care program, which everyone in America was going to have to pay for whether you use it or not, which would put the government, I think at the time, healthcare in the United States was around one ninth uh, of the maybe 10, 11, 15% of the total US economy. But healthcare itself was about 11, 12% of the total US economy, maybe 15. And Limbaugh pointed this out. Limbaugh was screaming from the rooftops. This is a terrible idea. You cannot give the federal government authority to oversee, you know, a a ninth or an eighth or 15% of the United States economy because they'll ruin it. They'll screw it up. That's what they do. They don't make things better. They destroy things. You say, okay, what's your point, Paul? My point is this. That was a trial balloon. They knew that at the time, the govern the, the people weren't ready to accept that, but it didn't matter because they needed to establish the narrative. They needed to establish the argument. They needed to establish the fact that it was a an idea with merit. And then what happened? They waited. They bided their time. And we, as a, as a nation, 
uh, decided that we were going to be imbeciles once again. Did you and say that they bide in their time? They bide their time. Oh, they bide that would be kind of Biden. funny. Biden Did their you time. bide in their, their time? time? We decided to be a collective group of imbeciles again. And, of course, knowing what we know now, I have... 100 percent faith and belief that there was that there was election fraud and chicanery going on in 12 and 16 or uh, not 12, 16 um uh 8 08 and and 012 and 12 012 2012 but uh so we waited uh and they waited the democrat they're patient that you know if anything they're patient so they floated that trial. And there's been a lot of them over the years. There's been a lot. So they floated, but this is just one good good example. Universal health care. The government's going to take it over. They're going to force people to get government insurance. And if you don't, they're going to fine you. They're going to tell doctors what they can and can't do. They're going to tell hospitals what they can and can't do. Well, in 1994 or 5 and so forth, people said, no, this is a bad idea. We don't want it. No. Go away, ugly, evil harpy. Well, what happens? We have a, a collective brain damage, and we put a communist, uh, a black, a half black Marxist. We allow a half black Marxist to be installed as the president. And what did we get? We got Obamacare. That, and what did it do? It screwed the American healthcare system. They started fining people for not having their program, punishing people for not having their program. Ladies and gentlemen, I know you're not going to like to hear this, but we're you're going to live through a severe doctor shortage. What are you talking about, doctor shortage? Well, I have doctors. I have doctors as friends. And uh, what I've been told by people who are actual medical doctors is that when Obamacare came in, and they and the government said to the doctors, this is how you have to do it. This is what you have to do. Well, a lot of them said, I'm I'm close to retirement. I don't need this crap. Peace out. Right. And they did. They peaced out. Jared, do you know what just occurred to me right now? What? That the o- Obamacare was the setup for covid i don't know what that means i'll tell you exactly what it means what did i tell you how do you get a military that will just obey orders how do you get people in the military that won't think that will just obey orders and do what they're told you do exactly what they did the last 10 years i told you guys that independently minded, thoughtful, intelligent officers and NCOs, because I was there, I saw this happening. When they started this uh, mandatory racial and gender sensitivity training, and when they started this mandatory don't ask, don't tell stuff, when they start, when they started turning the government into, a, or the military into a hardcore, woke, leftist social experiment, when they started telling our fighting men that you can't refer to the enemy in mean derogatory terms. I'm like, you what now? Yeah, you you can't say those like so you want me to go over there and kill them, but you don't want me to say like mean stuff. When I was when we were told that the use of profanity in the military is is not acceptable. What? So this is what happened. A lot of seasoned, experienced, intelligent officers and NCOs said, fornicate this crap. I'm out of here. And who stayed? Who didn't mind? Who said, well, I don't care. Doesn't matter. I'll I'll sit through the, the racial, gender, ethnic sensitivity training i can't do anything about it anyway i'll just yeah i can't do anything who stayed and that makes sense though. the people who said it's a good job man i i get government i get bennies i get my bennies i get my health care 
the skaters, the pensioners, the ones who did the absolute. And I saw this. I've been there, done that. I got the freaking T-shirt. The absolute minimum. What is the least amount of work that I can possibly do and still get by? Those people stayed. The the other the people who are independently minded, who are self starters, who are alpha males, all said, "Fornicate this," and they got out. They went, became contractors. They started their own businesses. They made they created tourniquets to save people's lives. So who remains? People who will do who will do anything. If that they're told, they won't think they'll just do what they're told. The exact same things happening in our law enforcement agencies with the whole all cops are bastards thing and the defund the police movement and the yada, yada, yada. People who are self-starters, intelligent, motivated alpha males or females in law enforcement are like, I don't need this crap. I can go somewhere else and do way better, make more money and not have to deal with this bull crap. Bye. I'm gone. Who stayed? Not all. Calm down. But by and large, who stayed? People who will do anything for the paycheck. Doctors. 2008, 2000 through 2012. Obamacare. They tell the doctors. They they hand them a, a three. A, they're like, okay, you want to be a doctor in America? Here's the the Obamacare regs. Read them, learn them, memorize them. And if you do anything outside of these regs, we will punish you. We will fine you. We will take your medical license. And what do those doctors say? Right there, bro. Can I do this? The doctor said, go fornicate yourself. I don't need your crap. Bye. And then what happened? 2020. Why did so many current doctors diagnose patients who were in motorcycle accidents, heart attacks, cancer patients as COVID positive. How did were they able to get doctors to put COVID on medical diagnosis for automobile crash victims, for heart attack victims, for cancer victims? They're like cancer and COVID automobile crash and COVID. How did they get them to do that? How did they get doctors to recommend an untested shot? How did they get them to line up? Because what do we have? We flipped it on its head. We have people now in the medical profession that will do and say anything because they still need the money. They want the bennies. They want the money. We did it with the military. We did it with law enforcement. We did it with police. So what's next? Ladies and gentlemen, we have people in our society that will do and say anything for a paycheck. They'll do and say anything to stay in power. They'll do and say anything during a crisis. Jared and I talked about this. So money, getting back to money and tracking. This is important. Post-Civil War, after 1865, the American people had a, well, Northerners, Southerners, Westerners, a genuine distrust of paper money. There's a reason for that, because they didn't trust the government. In the South, they had a government, and they they had their own currency, and then the North violated the constitution they violated the 10th amendment and they invaded the south and imposed their will on them and then we had reconstruction and everybody in the south hated the north and they hated the carpetbaggers then you go west and so people out west a lot of the people out west were former confederates because they said you know what i'm not going to sit here in georgia alabama mississippi and allow these these blue-coated thugs to dictate how I live. I'm going to get on a train. I'm going to go to Kansas. I'm going to go to Oklahoma. I'm going to go to Texas. I'm going to go to these new territories, New Mexico, Arizona, and so forth. And that's what they did. So they had a genuine, real distrust for paper money. And for the federal government, that was a problem. 
All right. How do we get people to take our fiat currency, to take our paper? How do we get them to accept the paper? Now, I'm not saying that every single human being in, in the American West wouldn't take paper money, but a lot didn't. And a lot had a genuine, realistic distrust for it. And so the federal government, they began a process of trying to get people to, they're like, no, 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 you can, it's, it's backed by silver and gold and, and no, you can trust us. We promise. How many of you know about the 1907 panic, the panic of 1907 or what they call the Knickerbocker crisis? All right. For a thousand dollars. Zachary, what is a Knickerbocker? It's a, it's a defunct candy bar company. Eh. Jared, what is a Knickerbocker? Oh, man, $1,000 was on the line. Eh. It is a New Yorker. Knickerbocker is a nickname for New Yorkers. That's why the New York Knicks are actually, Knicks is actually K N I C H is actually short for the New York Knickerbockers. But I digress. So in, in uh, 1907, we had a worldwide financial crisis, right? We had a crisis. And the Knickerbocker, well, the reason Knickerbocker was in there is because you had banks and you had trusts. Now, the trusts were not required to maintain cash on hand. You know how your bank is supposed to have X amount of money on hand all the time, right? Now, we all should know, unless you're a moron, that all the deposits in the bank aren't actually in the bank, right? So you have, let's say, 100 people who all put $100 into the bank so you have 100 times 100, and that money is in the bank. So if all 100 people walk into the bank today and want their $100, the bank can give it to them, right? No. It's like the you know the, the George and the freaking It's a Wonderful Life. He's like, I, your money's not here. It's in George's. It's in Fred's house, and it's in Johnny's coffee shop, and your money is in, you know, it's not just here. And you know, in that, and that was actually a really good movie to to show like what happens when people like all run into the bank and say, "We want our money." Like, uh, you can't have it. What do you mean we can't have it? So in 1907, how many, Jared? Remember when you were in high school and they taught you about the 1907 banking crisis? Jared's shaking his head. He said, "No." You mean they didn't teach you about that in school? So what happened? Well. You had a crisis, and what did they do? There was bank runs, and people got scared. They were afraid that the banks were screwing them over. Well, how do we fix that? If you're a federal government and you want to fix or you want to capitalize on a crisis. See, a lot of people out there, how many of you people out there think that the never let a crisis go to waste idea or mentality or tactic just came about in the last 15, 20 years. <laughs> Dudes, the never let a crisis go to waste has been in play for over 100 years, well over 100 years. People in government have understood for well over, I'd say 200 years, that if you can get the, the citizens panicked enough in a state of fear enough you can control them or you can convince them to do things that are not genuinely in their best interest. Well, the, the Federal Reserve Act, when did the Federal Reserve Act go in? Federal Reserve Act. And there's a book on the Jared Shelf behind him that uh, is, what is it called? It's called the... Uh, creature from Jekyll Island, and it's about the Federal Reserve Bank. So the Federal Reserve Act was passed during the Wilson administration. Wilson was a straight-up socialist piece of human crap, all right? 1913, how did they get that through? How did they convince 
the Congress and the Senate to pass that. Well, due to the panic of 1907 and the crisis that was created, do you think that the that the banks didn't know what they were doing in 1907? They didn't know that the situation was dire. They didn't know that people could possibly that having requiring a trust to only have 5% of the total deposits on hand was a bad idea. They didn't know that. They didn't think it was a bad idea. Or maybe they knew it was a, a bad idea and they didn't care. And they said, well, what if people find out and they panic? Then it'll be a crisis. Then we can step in. We can create a crisis. You see, way before the Nazis set the Reichstag on fire, right? Way before the Reichstag fire. We use the Reichstag fire as the example of creating a crisis and then stepping in to present yourself as the solution to the crisis you created. Dude, we did that 100 years ago, over 100 years ago. So the banks, they create a crisis. The people panic. They go to their congressmen and their senators and they say, you have to do something about this. You have to fix it. And they say, okay, so who was it? Was it seven guys? Jared, that got on the train and went to Jekyll Island. Was it seven? It was either seven or nine. I can't remember the specific number. So the, the richest men in America got on a train, took a boat, went to an island, and they came up with the idea of the Federal Reserve Bank. Then they came back and they fed it to Congress. They fed them that idea. Now, keep in mind, the people were still panicky and nervous about their money because of the 1907 crisis. So they voted for it, and it became law, and we have the Federal Reserve Act. The Federal Reserve Bank is not a part of the federal government, never has been. They allowed the creation of a privately held Federal Reserve Bank. So where does that put us now? What did we just have? We had a massive crisis, right? With the COVID, it was a massive crisis. Remember during COVID, during the height of COVID, Jared, when they when they tried to tell people not to take cash because it might have the virus on it? Remember that? And they're like, "Oh, use your card only, or use Apple Pay, but don't don't use don't transfer cash because it could have the virus on it." But people weren't ready. People were like, that's stupid. You're an idiot. That was a trial balloon. That was a test. And then we came out of. So what happened in Salt Lake City at the Vivint Arena? Vivint was shut down. No live concerts, no anything. Because of the vid, right? Then they changed, then they changed the regs. They're like, oh, okay, you can come back. You can, but you can only have so many, but whatever. So they shut down. They came back. And when they came back, they were cashless. No cash. Cards only. Cards are Apple Pay, but no cash. No cash at all. I think that the cashless thing happened before COVID. Nope. I'm I'm pretty sure it was. I went to an event. I'm pretty sure in late, at the Vivint in 2019. It, it was and used real money to buy stuff. I'm pretty sure that it was before COVID that it went cashless. Really? Yeah, it was in 2019. I'm almost positive. Because I went to a wrestling event before the vid, and I'm pretty sure I used cash. Because and, and we it was like, only it was February of 2020, I believe. Because yeah, it was like Zach and I went to a wrestling event at the Vivid in February of 2020. And I don't remember. Now, my memory's usually pretty good, but there's a lot of stuff going on back then. Uh, January 14th, 2020 is when it went, and that week is when it went cashless. Oh, really? Okay. So it was at the beginning. So it was right the it, beginning. Uh, it started in 2017, the renovation to do that. Okay. So cashless. 
began its cashless transition in October of 2019. Hmm. All right. Well, there you go. I I did not recall that. So crisis, what's happening right now in the United States of America? Well, cash is being devalued. Your money is being devalued. Inflation is being used to devalue your money. A crisis is being created. We got a story here um, that I'll touch on real briefly. You may have seen it, you might not have. Christy Noem, and and after she did this, she went out publicly to say, "You got pay attention. All of your states are being fed these, and the idiots in Utah voted on this. You know that, Jared, right? Yeah, the idiots in Utah voted for this. So UCC, uniform, uh, what does it stand for? Uniform commercial codes. Seems like a completely inconsequential thing you're like yeah whatever who cares if they're they're just voting to use standardization standard language can you read the veto letter from her yeah she says uh house bill 1193 adopts a definition of money to specifically exclude cryptocurrencies like bitcoin as well as other digital assets at the same time the ucc revisions include central bank digital currencies as money by expressly in excluding cryptocurrencies as money it would become more difficult to use it all right by needlessly limiting the freedom by this freedom hb would would put south dakota at a disadvantage she vetoed it ladies and gentlemen this is what you need to understand and this is the nut the nut is this If you allow your state, if you allow the federal government to create a crisis and then use the crisis to force you into accepting digital money, you can't use paper anymore. You have to surrender your paper. Jared, did you know in New York City they have reverse ATMs where they're encouraging people to feed their cash into the ATM and to get a a credit, an on-demand credit card as a replacement for their cash. Interesting. Why would you do that? That's a psyop. Cash is dirty. Cash is bad. Cash is inconvenient. No, cash is freedom. What do we go go back to the, the visa tries to create a red flag for gun purchases? They're like, yeah, but they backed off. That was a trial balloon. That was a trial balloon. They do that. They see where they're going to get the resistance. Then they formulate their plan to override the previous resistance that they've gotten. Here's what the dog king and his minions don't have to eliminate the Second Amendment. They don't have to go around the Second Amendment. They don't have to get Congress or the Senate to vote on anything. Because once they control your money, they control everything you purchase. Do you understand this? If you don't have individual control of your money, if all of your money is a central bank, that means your local... Why do you think your small local banks are being destroyed and gutted and the big banks, the J.P. Morgans, the creatures from Jekyll Island are gobbling up little banks. Why do you think that your local coffee shop had to be put out of business while Target and Walmart got to stay in business? Did Target and Walmart get put out of business? Did Home Depot get put out of business by the vid? No. Who got put out of business by the vid? Little, small mom and pop shops. Individuals were destroyed. Corporations were allowed to live because corporations can be controlled by the government. They donate millions to the Democrat reelection campaigns. They don't need to pass any more anti gun anything legislation once they control your money. Because, A, all every firearms purchase that you make will be tracked. 
and traced. They won't even need 4473s anymore. They'll go, I mean, they'll still make you do it because you have to be forced to do that to keep you in line, to keep you on your leash, on your chain. That's the chain that they put around your neck is seeking their permission. All they have to do is shut it off. And if they can shut it off for guns, they can shut it off for everything. They can shut it off for meat, eggs, milk. They can shut it off for gasoline. They can shut it off for anything, and you won't be able to do a damn thing about it. You better get serious about your freaking money. Because no cash equals no guns equals no liberty. We got a question. Uh, 26 is great. The question is, what size nose hose should I put in my ankle med kit? I currently have 26. That's perfectly fine. Zach, that's what comes in all the PLS kits, right? Yeah, I do believe it is a 26 gauge or FR yeah. or whatever it's called. Um, a nasal pharyngeal airway, they come in lots and lots of different sizes. Uh, it's not just the diameter, it's also the length. And the, the larger diameter, the longer, longer it is. Uh, they have really big ones for like big hoss type dudes. And then they have really tiny ones for kids and stuff. Uh, it's hard because if you have a little tiny one, yeah, it'll go in a big hoss's nose, but it won't get back far enough. Uh, in their throat to actually work and won't get back to the trachea where it needs to be. So it has to be long enough to get back there. And, and so a, a good, a happy medium, the one that the U.S. military has adopted for all their kits is the 26. That's why we put it in our kits. So that's a good question. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if you don't have cash, you don't have liberty, you don't have guns. That's the bottom line. And any any politician that tries to sell you on, oh, it's more convenient or it's more secure. How is a notional digital currency more secure than physical currency? How is it more secure? Oh, but it's so much more convenient. Convenient for who? Person who wants to track and control everything I do and everything I purchase? You better, you better get serious about your liberty, folks. Because they don't need to pass any more anti-gun, anti-magazine, anti-ammo, anti-anything bills once they control everything you buy. Once they control everything you buy, that's it. You have no liberty. And if you don't care about your liberty, I don't know why you're here. Uh, so, All right, that's Cat in the Hat and that be that, Buster Rhyme. Tomorrow, all right, tomorrow. Courage and fasting. Yes, on Thursday's bonus hour, we're going to talk about courage and fasting. Until we're together again, ladies and gentlemen, remember, you're a beginner once. You're a student for life. You're a student for life. Thanks for staying until the end. Want to water the seeds of freedom we planted together today? Head over to wherever you listen to us and leave a like, rating, or review. It makes a big difference. Have a show topic submission? We would love to hear it. Submit it to info at studentofthegun.com. A delightful human will get back to you faster than you can finish a one-box workout. Remember to check studentofthegun.com often for new and free content, giveaways, and more. Watch, listen, read, shop, and connect at studentofthegun.com. And remember, you are a beginner once, a student for life.